want to begin by um, having you imagine, let's say, a converse, conversation between um, two engineers, let's say, fairly young students, either graduate or undergraduate, and um, they are either engineers or scientists, so they're not, you know, they, they, they understand science and engineering to some extent, okay? And let's say uh, one person who is a believer in global warming and climate change tells his, his or her friend that um, here's some data, shows him some data that shows the average temperature of the earth creeping up slowly, okay? And his friend, who is a non-believer in global warming or climate change says, so what? This could have happened 10,000 years ago. You just don't have any proof that it never happened. So then this person says, shows him another plot which shows the CO2 in the atmosphere also. And he says, but yeah, you were right that it could have happened before, but here's CO2 data, okay? And there's a perfect correlation between these two. And then, it, then his friend says, I don't understand. What do you mean CO2 temperature? I don't understand the connection, okay? And then the person says, uh, well, don't you know CO2 is a greenhouse gas? It's trapping all the radiation. And his friend says, but yeah, H2O is also a greenhouse gas. It's also there in the atmosphere. So what? I mean, why do you keep talking about CO2? And what's the connection with temperature? So you see where this is leading to. And this is where the discussion sort of falls apart, OK? Because after this, this person is unable to explain the connection between CO2 and temperature, OK? Uh, so it's like circumstantial evidence. And you have to make the story believable that this is what's happening. So what I want to talk about today is, or what I want to really uh, bring out today is this connection. What is the connection really between carbon dioxide and temperature, OK? And then the second question is, OK, like we said, there is water vapor. What about water vapor? Why is that not considered hazardous? OK? So I want to throw a disclaimer right away that I'm not an environmental scientist, and I don't work or do research in these areas. But uh, my understanding of it comes mainly from uh, radiation transport in the atmosphere, which obviously is the core physics or the underlying physics that governs all this and so I'm going to speak from that perspective and you know I'm not trying to trying to be in either camp I just want to present the science as it is all right so I want to start off with uh, <clears throat> with this question is the earth really warming up and this is basically what we're saying here is the data that um, that I was talking about right at the beginning, showing that the Earth is warming up. Now, this is, uh, I'll show you the uh, it from the YouTube panel. This is a YouTube video that was published by NASA. This comes straight out of nasa.gov. There's a YouTube channel by NASA. Uh, it was published in January of 2016, okay? So what this shows, and I'll play the video in a moment that you will see, it shows the temperature of the Earth, okay? And you can see this is a contour plot from 1888 uh, all the way up to 2014, I think it's the last year, okay? Uh, so pretty significant period of time. And what it shows you really is not the temperature itself, but the deviation of temperature from the average temperature of the Earth between 1950 and 1980. So what they did was they took a baseline, 1950 to 1980, and then they looked at the data as a difference from that data, okay? And it's also a moving average. It's not a yearly average. It's a five-year moving average. So, you know, little fluctuations are basically smoothed out, all right? So anything that appears in blue is actually cold, colder than the average. Anything that appears in orange or red, it's hotter than the average, okay? So keep that in mind when you watch this video. So as you can see, this is straight out of uh, nasa.gov, okay? So this is not some somebody putting up a video and me showing you. Now, you know, often there are questions raised about where did this data come from? And actually there are, if, you, if I click this button, show more, there are some links that NASA provides and how they obtain the data and all that. 
bottom line is most of the early data in the 1800s were obtained mainly by extrapolation of so-called ice core data. So what they do is they dig up these ice cores from glaciers and from that they can infer the carbon dioxide concentration and to some extent temperature, okay? Whereas anything after World War II is actual measured data. Okay, so you have to keep that in mind that the data towards the second half of this video is actually more believable and, and you know, direct measurements as opposed to what you see before. Okay, so let me play this video. So this is World War I just over, World War II, okay, and now we are getting really into the heart of industrial progress. Okay, and you see what's happening here, all right, clearly. So very blue towards the beginning, little patches of yellow, orange, and then right after the Industrial Revolution kicks on, you start seeing more red, and from the 70s, 80s onwards, it turns pretty orange. Okay, so you can see here it's turning orange, and by the time you get to 2015, there it is. Okay, so as I said, this is the last half is real data, measured data, and again, you can go to those websites and look at how they collected the data, how it's processed, and so on, okay? So I'm not in a position to dispute this data, or you know, I just take it for what it is. I say, okay, NASA is NASA, and I'm gonna believe in this data, all right? Now, one of the things also worth noting, uh, and we're gonna get back to this later on, you see how the poles right there are redder, than you know, the equator, that's an important point. Just keep that in mind when we, ex when we discuss all this, all right? Okay, so then the question is, we've seen that the Earth is warming up, so the question is, what is causing the Earth's warming? Okay, <clears throat> now, let's, get back to the very basic. So we have the Earth, and uh, that dotted line basically represents the atmosphere, as you know. And we know, so this is getting back to basic thermodynamics, it's a closed system, meaning there is no mass inflow or outflow from anywhere. The only interaction it has with the universe is through energy exchange or sunlight, okay? Uh, so that's pretty obvious. So therefore, if more energy comes in than what leaves, the Earth will get warmer. That's pretty straightforward to understand. Okay, what is the energy source? It's the sun, all right? And there have, of course, been lots of arguments where people have said, oh, this, all this warming is due to solar flares and so on, you know, so the sun is sort of touted as the devil. Um, but there are counter arguments to that too, and we'll talk about that in a moment. All right, so we have the sun and we have the earth. So during the daytime, the sun is shining, okay? And you can think of it as, discussion purposes, half of the Earth, okay? The other half is dark. And so let's say only half of the Earth is receiving energy. And during the night, that same energy has to go out. If these two balance, your temperature will stay the same, okay? This is very basic system level thermodynamics. <clears throat> now, there is no medium, of course, beyond about 31 miles of the Earth's atmosphere. This is where the stratosphere ends, and after that, pretty much you have vacuum. Uh, so we have to believe that radiation is the only mode of heat transfer or energy transfer, or conduction and convection, those modes don't come into play because, you know, for millions of miles there is really nothing, okay? So this implies that global warming is being caused by radiation trapping. In other words, more is coming in during the day, less is leaving during the night, and as a result, the temperature is slowly creeping up. Okay, so then, then the next question is, uh, what is responsible for radiation trapping? Okay. And clearly, the only culprit that we can think of in this whole picture is this little layer there, the atmosphere. That must be the one, because there is nothing else in between. Okay. So the key pieces of the puzzle are 
the atmosphere, the sun, and then basically the highway between the two, which is radiation. So we have to understand how this interacts with that. All right. So I want to uh, spend a couple of slides talking about the basic physics of radiation, because this is very important to understand. If you don't understand this, you will not get the connection between temperature and CO2. All right, so we have to spend some time on this, even though this may be very mundane stuff. This is typically covered in undergraduate heat transfer classes for those of you in the engineering fields. Um, but let's go over that a little bit. So first of all, we know light is electromagnetic waves traveling at the speed of light. Well, uh, radiation we're talking about. Uh, speed of light is approximately 3 times 10 to the power 8. It does not require a medium, can travel through vacuum. From a quantum mechanical perspective, we often call them photons, basically energy packets traveling in straight lines. Okay? And the energy of a photon is the Planck constant H times the frequency nu. Okay? Uh, now, here's an important fact. All radiation is not the same. The frequency or the wavelength, this guy here, matters. And this is what leads to all sorts of complexity. This is very different from conduction, for example, where we don't think about wavelengths frequencies okay <clears throat> now the frequency dependence of radiation um, by the way is responsible for a variety of things that we see around us in nature we often don't realize it but it's going on uh, for example the sky happening uh, appearing blue this happens because of Rayleigh scattering uh, nitrogen in the atmosphere preferentially scatters blue light okay well it scatters all all colors but um, for the path of the atmosphere that we look at, especially during a time of the day like now, um, the blue is the one that scatters the most. When you get to larger inclinations of the sun and it has to travel longer distances through the atmosphere, what all the colors get an opportunity to scatter. And that's why dusk is often a mixture of colors. You see red, blue, orange, purple, all colors. Right? Uh, but it's due to Rayleigh scattering. Um, leaves appearing green. Over centuries or over millennia, uh, plants have adapted in a way where they've figured out. Now, here's the thing. If you look at, and this is something we'll talk about, if you think about the sun's radiation, the dominant wavelength of radiation is green light. Okay? Uh, this comes from the Wien's displacement law. We'll talk about this. Um, about 0.5 microns. The wavelength of green light is about 512 nanometers, okay? Which means that if you break up the spectrum, you will find most of the energy is contained within the green part of the spectrum, all right? And so plants have adapted in a way where they said, well, if we absorb that green light, we are literally going to get cooked. So we better reflect the green light away, okay? And so the green light from the leaves get reflected away, and that's what we observe, our eye observes, green color. All right, so that's evolution. Uh, again, it has to do with the wavelength nature of uh, radiation. And of course, the greenhouse effect, which is what we are going to talk about today, which, as you know, is responsible for so-called global warming, okay? So let's talk a little bit about the physics of radiation, and this is where the wavelength dependence comes in and all that. So. The biggest contributor to this work was Max Planck, uh, who won the Nobel Prize for this work in 1918. Actually, he's the one, I'll tell you in a, in a little bit, uh, what he exactly did. Um, so what I'm showing you, this is just straight out of a textbook. You can see the source there. What this is showing you is black body emissive power okay, versus wavelength. What does this mean? That means that if I have a black body at a certain temperature, it is going to emit certain power or radiation, as you can see the units are watts per meter square per, kel per uh, micron. Okay, So at each wavelength it is going to emit a certain power and that's what's shown on the y-axis is the log scale and on the x-axis you have wavelength. Okay? And then there are various curves. So what this is basically saying is that suppose I have a surface at 1000 Kelvin, okay, right here. So the energy emitted by that surface, if, if we think of it as a perfect emitter, a black body, okay, is constrained within that wavelength range. Beyond that, there is no energy. 
emitted by that body. Okay, so you see its peak is somewhere here. Uh, this is 10 to the power zero, one micron. So it's about two, maybe about three microns or so, close to three microns. If I go higher up in temperature, you see the peak emission, the wavelength of peak emission changes. And not only that, these curves expand out, okay? meaning that more energy is being emitted. And the predominant wavelength that we, which it is emitting is shifting to the left. So the hotter the temperature, it's shifting more to the left. The colder the temperature, it's shifting more to the right. Okay? If I have a body at 5,000 Kelvin, okay, um, okay but let me just move ahead a little bit here. So the other thing I want to show you here is these, this gray patch here. This is really the visible part of the spectrum. Okay? 0.4 microns is basically violet light. 0.7 microns is red light. So that's your vip -GR, the visible part of the spectrum. Uh, so what I was going to say is that suppose you look at a body at 500 Kelvin. 500 Kelvin is about 230 degrees Celsius. Okay, pretty hot. But do you actually see that it's hot? No. If you put a pan on a stove and it heats up to 230 Celsius, you won't see it. Why? Because all the wavelengths it's emitting is beyond the visible part of the spectrum. You cannot see it. Okay. Whereas you take a flame, let's say, which is around 2,000 Kelvin, you see it, okay? And that's because much of the energy that it is emitting is in the visible part of the spectrum. And as, as the flame, let's say, gets hotter and hotter, you see more and more towards blue color. And that's why we say blue hot is hotter than red hot, okay? Because red hot is here, lower temperature. The peak is closer to red. And by the time you move that way, you are more towards the blue side of the spectrum. So blue is hotter. Okay? The 5762 that you see here, this is the average temperature or close to the average temperature of the sun. So you see the emission by the peak emission by the sun is right in the middle of the visible part of the spectrum. And as I was telling you, green light is the dominant. Okay? It emits all colors as you can see. Okay? And green is the dominant. All right? So this is a little bit about uh, the Planck distribution. Now, what Planck really contributed to this work was, so there, there were two other scientists who worked before Planck, okay, James Jeans and uh, Lord Rayleigh. They came up with the Rayleigh gene distribution, which actually had this part of the curve correct, but towards this part, it failed. It just went to infinity, okay? So what Planck did was he introduced quantum mechanics. And he, this work was completely theoretical. And with the introduction of quantum mechanics, he showed that this curve is actually going to bend down. And of course, later on, it was measured and proven that this is how black body distributions look like. And that's how, how he won the Nobel Prize in 1980. Now, this is, um, so like I said, this is violet. So this is UV. And then this part here is infrared. Okay, And if you integrate this curve, the entire area, is your Stefan Boltzmann law, which I'm sure everybody here knows. Okay, sigma t to the fourth, sigma being the Stefan Boltzmann constant. So that's the area underneath the curve. So the hotter the temp, the higher the temperature, obviously sigma t to the fourth is higher. Okay, and so the area under the curve is larger. Now, one thing I just want to caution you here is, since this is on a log scale, this kind of looks a little weird, this curve. But really, this curve is a very, if you plot it on a linear scale, it's a very skinny curve. Okay, and dies down rapidly. And so really, this part of the spectrum, just the visible part, has 36% of the sun's energy, even though it doesn't look like this on this plot, that that area is 36% of the total. Okay, But it is, because this is plotted on a log scale, so it doesn't appear that way. There is another person who contributed a lot to the understanding of radiation, and that's Wien, another um, German physicist who won the Nobel Prize in 1911. Okay. Uh, so he came up with a law, which is actually, as you see, it precedes Planck's law. Um, he said that if somebody gave me a temperature, can I tell him right away what is the dominant wavelength of emission from that hot source? Suppose I say, okay, I have 600 Kelvin. What's the color it's predominantly emitting? Okay, that's this law. You simply take 2898, divide by 600, you get lambda max. Okay, which is really the maxima of this function. So you can see here, if I take 5762, 
divided, or 2898 divided by 5762, I'm going to get about 0.5, which is right in the middle of the visible part of the spectrum, which is what I said is green light. Okay, so that was his contribution. Now, he, he did not use any theory. This was just measurements work that he did independently. Okay, now, of course, it's clear that if I take Planck's distribution, we have expressions for those now and differentiate it and put it equal to zero, I should be able to calculate the maximum, right? Should be able to get that formula. Um, but he won the Nobel Prize for this, and the reason is, of course, it was in opposite chronological order. He did this first before Planck came up with his law. And later on, of course, people found that, well, if you differentiate Planck's law, you get Green's law, okay? That's why both of them won the Nobel Prize, because it was in reverse chronological order. So this is, this is something very important, this law, we, very simple law, but we'll get back to this again and again because it tells us if I have a certain source of energy, what is the dominant wavelength that's being emitted by it, okay? And I already mentioned this, that for the sun, it's about 0.5 microns, which is green, green color, okay? And I also mentioned this, 36% is in that little band there. All right, let's talk a little bit about the sun. So we discussed the physics of radiation a little bit. Now we are going to discuss the two pieces, the sun and the atmosphere, okay? So the sun is a hydrogen plasma. Average temperature, um, we'll see in a moment. Mean distance from the Earth is approximately 1.5, 10 to the power 11. Um, you know this, uh, it takes about eight minutes to reach the Earth, the sunlight. Diameter is 109 times that of Earth. And the mean temperature, fluctuates between these values, people often use an average value of 57, 77 Kelvin, okay? Um, the other important thing is that people have done measurements of the energy, energy distribution function. That same function that I showed you, that was the black body distribution function, but if you take the real energy distribution function of the sun and compare it to a black body at 57, 77 Kelvin, you find that they're almost identical, which proves that the sun is like a black body at 57, 77 Kelvin. So for understanding and analysis purposes, we often use that, that okay, sun is a black body at that temperature. Here's a little bit about the Earth's atmosphere. We have five layers. Uh, pretty much after the stratosphere, we don't bother about so much because there's really nothing in there. So the two layers that are of, um, of significance are the troposphere and the stratosphere. Okay, this is the composition and this is in uh, order of concentration. You can see nitrogen obviously is the topmost, and then oxygen, um, and then argon, all right? Uh, by the way, I, I mentioned uh, Lord Rayleigh. Lord Rayleigh was the one who discovered argon, okay? Um, does anybody know who discovered greenhouse effect? Joseph Fourier, He's the same guy who whose name you see in Fourier Law, uh, Fourier Series. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> okay, so this is the order. Now you see a um, couple of gases I've marked here in red, obviously, okay. Um, here is water vapor. Its concentration is higher than that of carbon dioxide, as you can see, okay. And then down below here, we have methane, we have ozone, carbon monoxide, now, all the ones that have, and of course there are particles, ice crystals, and so on, so forget about these guys, but all, all the ones that you see up here on top, they are typically designated by environmental scientists as quote unquote greenhouse gases, okay? Um, there are of course other gases, but we'll get to a moment why they are not termed greenhouse gases or why they are not important, okay? But water vapor and carbon dioxide distinctly shows up at the top. There is methane and all that, but very small percentage. Okay, so some observations, and this is, a, this is a definition semantics issue. What is a greenhouse gas? You're often asked the question, okay? I pulled out something from Wikipedia, which I advise my students not to do, but uh, this is actually, a, the Wikipedia's, uh, this, these sentences come from a textbook that they have cited, a textbook on atmospheric science, okay? So this is straight out of a textbook, really couple of things I want to point out. So the definition of a greenhouse gas 
is it is, an, it is a gas in the atmosphere that absorbs and emits radiation within the thermal infrared range. That's its only definition. Okay, we talked about the infrared range, 0.7 micron and beyond. Okay, close to that, it's called near infrared. Far away, beyond 10 microns, it's called far infrared. All right, so that's its definition. You clearly see there is water vapor here, carbon dioxide here, mentioned as the first two greenhouse gases, the most important ones. Okay. The other sentence I'd like to draw your attention to, it says that if the average, uh, if the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere were missing altogether, no CO2, no H2O, then the Earth would be about 15 degrees colder on an average. Okay? So these greenhouse gases are good. They are maintaining an equilibrium temperature, or they are supposed to maintain this equilibrium temperature that we feel comfortable in. Unfortunately, now they are changing. Their concentrations are changing, and so that's where the problem is. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind also. Now here is the list of gases. So you have water vapor, carbon dioxide, etc. Here in the definition, greenhouse gases and examples. Here is the list of gases with the so-called highest global warming potential provided by the IPCC. Now the IPCC has these huge reports on global warming and climate change. This is basically hundreds of uh, scientists working together in unison preparing these reports. I mean, these people are really know the inside out of what's happening, okay? A lot of data, a lot of interesting um, analysis, okay? And this is what they came out with. So carbon, carbon dioxide you see at, is at the top of the list, okay? Um, this is, you see here, this is pretty close to 400 parts per million, I want you to memorize that number for now, okay? For the first time in the year 2015, CO2 concentration went above 400 ppm, okay? And you see that here, this is in 2005, already they're saying 379 plus minus 0.65, all right? Now the thing to note here is that H2O is conspicuously missing. I mean, obviously we were talking about H2O, I just said its concentration is much higher, but the IPCC thinks H2O is useless or not important, not relevant. So the question is why? Why are we so focused on CO2? Why don't we even bother about H2O? Even though it is a greenhouse gas with much higher percentage concentration in the atmosphere. Okay, so we'll try to answer this question. So when solar radiation, again a bit, a bit of basics, travels through a layer of gas, two things happen. Of course you have absorption, okay? What does absorption do? It basically, it's like a photon striking a material, a gas, let's say in this case, okay? And that energy gets absorbed within the bonds, excites it, heats it up, its internal energy increases, okay? And what you see going out at this end is a much lower quantity than what came in, okay? It's kind of like if I take a laser pointer and shine it into fog, you won't see anything at the other end at all. It got absorbed, right? So something like that. And then you have scattering, all right? And scattering, what it really does, it redistributes the energy directionally. So from an energy balance point of view, this is not affecting your energy balance at all. What comes in goes out. Yes, it's changed direction, but it still goes out, all right? Whereas here, what came in got stored within this material, some of it. Not all of it went out, okay? So really, when people think about global warming and, and uh, you know, radiation transport through the atmosphere, they usually talk just about it, that absorption, because that's the one that we're interested in. So key facts about absorption. The same material does not absorb all wavelengths equally. Just to give you an example, commercial window glass that you see here, it is transparent or a very weak absorber to visible radiation. As you can see, the sunlight coming in through the window but almost opaque to infrared radiation, okay? So, you know, the energy that's trying to go out, if it is in the infrared range, okay, larger wavelengths, it's not going to go out through the window. It's going to block all that radiation, all right? Um, if you take a car, let's say on a winter day parked outside, sunlight comes in, the windshield is completely almost transparent, okay? It comes in, and then it heats up all the seats and everything, right? So the seats heat up 
let's say on a winter day it heats up to maybe 290 Kelvin or so. Let's say 15 degrees Celsius, something like that. Okay, 300 Kelvin, let's take a ballpark value. Now if you apply that Wien's displacement law we talked about, lambda max times T is 2898. If you divide 2898 by 300 Kelvin, you get approximately 10 microns. 10 microns is way in the infrared. So what happens, the radiation that comes in cannot go back out anymore. That's really your greenhouse effect. Okay, that's why a car even parked in severe winter conditions can warm up very quickly. That's why we put these tarps on, on greenhouses, because it does the same thing, okay? Uh, so this is again to do with the wavelength nature of radiation. The amount absorbed changes exponentially with distance. It does not change linearly. So what you get here, and you move a distance d, and you move another distance d, this is going to decay exponentially, not linearly. Okay. And this is sometimes referred to as the Beer-Lambert law in, in the physics world. But this is really a simplification of what's called the radiative transfer equation. Uh, so this law says that the transmissivity of that layer, which is the ratio of what goes out to what comes in, is an exponential function that decays with the length. Okay. Where this constant here is called the absorption coefficient. This absorption coefficient is really a measure of how powerful is this absorber. It depends on a number of different things. I'm not going to get into that right away. But generally, for any material, it depends on the so-called refractive index and absorptive index. Okay, you know radiation is an electromagnetic wave. So it's electric waves and magnetic waves traveling simultaneously. And there are two coefficients that come into play that affects these two kinds of waves. Okay? And those two coefficients are often um, expressed in the form of what's called a complex index of refraction. All right? uh, so those two indices of refraction essentially affects this absorption coefficient. All right? The product of these two, so this has units of one over distance, one over meter. The product of these two is a non-dimensional quantity and is often referred to as the optical thickness of a medium. Okay, so if I say optical thickness is 100, then it means you almost cannot see through it. Okay? Because it will absorb really rapidly. On the other hand, if I say it's optical thickness 0, then that means it's completely transparent, like this room almost. So how do gases absorb radiation? So getting to a little bit of the physics. So what happens is uh, you have a gas, a molecular gas, let's say. It has electrons spinning about atoms. Okay, It has the atoms rotating about each other, vibrating against each other, and so on. Okay, So here's a cartoon showing different kinds of vibrational, rotational modes, for example. So you think of, OK, this is, for example, a water vapor molecule. It's, it's what's called a, um, a triatomic molecule, but uh, nonlinear. Okay, CO2 is a linear triatomic molecule like this, where you have the two O2s like that, rather than bent like that. This has more degrees of freedom, because obviously you can have rotation like that also. Okay. So bottom line is that when a photon hits a gas like this, it sets up either vibrational uh, patterns or rotational patterns. Sometimes an electron may jump from one orbit to another, and so on. So these types of transitions are known as bound-bound transitions. There can be other types of transitions where the energy is so large, the energy that strikes the molecule is so large, that an electron actually splits from the atom or molecule and is free. Okay? That's known as a bound-free transition. The energy required to do that is much higher, generally. You cannot shine a photon, typically, unless you concentrate it and do that. Okay? So if you think about sunlight hitting a gas, you're only going to get bound-bound transitions. Okay? Now, corresponding to each degree of freedom that we are showing in these pictures, there is an energy level. This, is, this comes right out of quantum mechanics. Okay? Uh, so the difference between continuum mechanics or classical mechanics and quantum mechanics is as follows. So you, if you take a rubber band, for example, okay, and you stretch it, uh, for every little bit that you are stretching, you can 
cal or you can measure how much force you are applying and what the displacement was, and you can draw a force displacement diagram, right? Everybody knows this. And that force displacement diagram is going to, going to be a continuous curve. Quantum mechanics says, no, that's not going to happen. It says, you keep pulling, 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 there will be zero displacement until suddenly this thing splits into two. Okay, and you get a discontinuous displacement all of a sudden. Okay, and then you pull, 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 this splits into three. Okay, so these, the force displacement diagram, if you look at from a quantum mechanical perspective, will be a bunch of like step functions, okay, discontinuous. And that leads to what are called energy levels or discontinuous energy levels. You jump from one energy level to another. You cannot have something in between. Okay? So that's something to keep in mind. And this is all Max Planck's work, of course. Um, so corresponding to each degree of freedom, like I said, there will be discrete energy levels. And the more complex the structure, obviously more degrees of freedom. So for example, if I bring in methane here, it will have even more degrees of freedom. Methane is actually a much stronger greenhouse gas than all the other ones because it has many degrees of freedom and it can absorb many different wavelengths or emit many different wavelengths, okay? By the way, emission absorption, same thing. It's just absorbing a photon versus emitting a photon, okay? <clears throat> so what really happens when you supply energy to a gas, these vibrational, rotational, or combined transitions, they may occur only if a full quantum of energy is available. Okay. So I'm showing you, you an example. This is a, really a mock cartoon here. So I'm saying, suppose I have an energy level, which is at this energy. So this is the frequency at in terahertz times the Planck constant. Okay. We know H nu is energy, right? So this is frequency in terahertz, Planck constant. And this is frequency in terahertz, Planck constant. And I take that gas, which has those two energy levels, let's say, and I shine some light on it. Okay. What's going to happen? only the green light is going to get absorbed, okay? That corresponds to 560 terahertz, which is the difference between these two. The rest cannot get absorbed because if I absorb red light, I'm saying I, I should go from here to here, but there is no energy level there. So the red light stays put, nothing happens to it. But the green gets absorbed because that's an allowable transition, okay? So when you look at the absorption spectra absorption or emission spectra of molecular gases, you see what is called this line structure, which says that, okay, there are discrete frequencies or wavelengths at which this energy is getting absorbed. Okay, they show up as lines in the, in the absorption or emission spectrum. Okay, now of course these lines get broadened and so on, and there are many mechanisms of that. They're not like discrete lines really. You know, there are mechanisms called uh, Lorentz broadening, collision broadening, Doppler broadening, all kinds of things happen. Uh, because of which they kind of spread out a little bit. But this is the, the basic physics, okay? And of course, since each gas is a completely different set of energy levels, these lines appear in different parts of the spectrum for, for each gas. For example, CO2 may have certain lines in this part of the spectrum. H2O may have absorption lines in this part of the spectrum because they're completely different molecules with completely different um, energy levels, all right? So that leads us then to... Uh, now, I just want to mention this di diatomic molecules. Now, what happens in diatomic molecules if you take O2 or N2 is, first of all, two atoms of the same mass, okay, just connected by a bond. Really, its number of degrees of freedom are very few, as opposed to CO2 or H2O or methane, right? I mean, if you just think about mass spring systems, two masses connected by a spring, how many degrees of freedom do you have for that? So any diatomic molecule or monatomic molecule has very few degrees of freedom and they are very poor absorbers. And that's why nitrogen and oxygen are very poor absorbers. They hardly do anything. They're like transparent to radiation, okay? And we don't bother about them, even though, our, though they are abundant in the atmosphere. We only worry about the ones that absorb or are radiatively active, okay? Uh, so I mentioned this already. Triatomic molecules are the ones that we bother about Again, there's also a distinction between H2O and CO2 because this is nonlinear. That's a linear triatomic molecule. So this has more degrees of freedom and is a stronger absorber than CO2 in general. Okay. Okay. So here's some real data. This is taken out of uh, a textbook by Goody and Jung. Okay. So what this is showing is absorption. Okay. And 
these are really arbitrary units. So don't bother about the units. You know, you see this number 50, 100, etc. Just take, take it as relative. Basically, 100 means maximum absorption, 0 means no absorption. Okay? So this is some sort of non dimensional absorption coefficient versus weight. Okay? Remember, visible part of the spectrum is somewhere here 0.4 to 0.7 microns, right there. Okay? So I'm showing. Uh, so this book had O2 and O3 ozone combined, but you see very little absorption by either O2 or ozone. Okay, what you see most active is H2O. Look at the number of absorption bands it has, huge number. Okay, and then right here in the far infrared, it's very absorptive. Okay, you look at CO2, there are a few bands. Okay, so this again shows that H2O is is the dominant absorber in the atmosphere. Now these bands, by the way, these are not the lines that I talked about earlier. These are a cluster of lines. Okay? If you zoom in close, this is what you see. This is where you see the line structure and the broadening of the lines. Okay? This is actually just 10 wave numbers, really high resolution. This is actually calculated. Uh, I did this calculation in 2002 from the so-called HITRAN, HITRAN database, which is a database that the uh, Harvard Smithsonian Institute maintains for atmospheric science calculations. Okay? Uh, so just wanted to make you aware of that. Okay, if I now mark the center of the CO2 bands, okay? You see here 2, 2.7, 4.3, 9.4, 10.4. .4. These numbers are important to remember, especially the 10.4 which I put here in port, and you will see in a moment why. Why the 10.4 micron band. So those are the band centers, okay? It's so important. Here's a picture of what the emissive power actually looks like. So what you see here, this dotted line here, this is the black body radiation of the sun, okay, which I showed you now. This is on a linear scale. That's why it looks like that instead of the bell-shaped curve. Okay, and I, I mentioned already that it looks pretty skinny if you look at, it, look at it in real scale. So here's the visible part of the spectrum. Here's ultraviolet, infrared, and so on. And all the absorption bands here are marked. This dark black line that you see here, this is the actual measured <coughs> energy that you receive on the surface of the Earth after the sunlight has gone through the atmosphere. Okay? So obviously, a lot of absorption by H2O, as we expected, based on what we saw here. Okay? So many of those blue bands you see. Okay? Now notice that for CO2, the first real band, I mean, this is, this is a tiny one, but these appear at 2.7, okay? If you look at now the spectrum of sunlight, 2.7 is here, okay? To the left of that, all you have here are these H2O bands. There is no CO2 at all, okay? So if I look at sunlight coming in, it's all absorption by H2O. There's a tiny little absorption band here around 2.7 microns for CO2. That's about it. Okay. So what does that mean? That means, so first of all, you have to remember that all of the sun's energy is below 3 microns approximately. There's nothing beyond that. Okay. H2O blocks a significant amount of the incoming energy. CO2 is almost transparent because there is this little band here, but that's about it. So when we look at the incoming radiation, what is really affecting that incoming radiation is water vapor. Okay? Nothing else. CO2 has almost no role. Okay? And of course, that's the peak. We talked about that already. That's a green light. So let's talk about the greenhouse effect. This is what's happening. So energy gain phase during the day. Okay? I've just brought over the two absorption coefficients that I plotted earlier for CO2 and H2 and kind of make them big to show you what's going on. This is where the energy of the sun is, this part of the spectrum, okay, up to about 3 microns. Beyond 3 microns, there is no energy, okay? So you see, if I look at the overlap with these bands, yes, I, I mentioned that there is an overlap with the 2.7 micron CO2 band, but the part of the energy in this part of the spectrum is very small anyway. So really, it's these H2O bands that's affecting that radiation. Okay? This is what is happening during the daytime. 
almost 80% transparent atmosphere. The 20% is mostly absorption by water vapor, um, you know, ice crystals, dust particles, things like that in the atmosphere. All right? CO2 has negligible role. Now you go to the nighttime when it's time to reject that energy that it gained. Okay? And again, same spectrum. This is where the Earth's energy now is. If you look at that black body radiation at 300 Kelvin approximately, it's shifted far to the infrared now. Okay? Because the Earth is now at about 300 Kelvin approximately, give or take. Okay? This is where the Earth's energy that it's trying to reject is, this part of the spectrum. All right? Now, if I do a little calculation using that Wien's displacement law we talked about, lambda max times T is equal to 2898. So if you plug in 20 degrees Celsius, which is 293 Kelvin, right here is where the peak is. Okay. If I do the cal same calculation at minus 20 degrees Celsius, 253 Kelvin, the peak shifts here. Okay. So couple of things to, of course, you know, the energy is being emitted on, in different uh, different uh, wavelengths, not just that wavelength, but at least you get an idea of which is the central wavelength around which it is, okay? Couple of things you see. You see this huge overlap with the CO2 10.4 micron band, okay? If you recall this video when I showed you, we talked about why are the poles the hottest? Here is your, one of your reasons. Okay. When you reject heat at colder temperatures, which is what the poles are doing, you are right in the middle of the absorption band of CO2, 10.4 micron. Okay. So the CO2 is more of a blocker when the emission is from colder temperatures than it is for hotter temperatures. That's one reason why the poles get hotter. The other reason, of course, is that with disappearing ice, the reflectivity of the Earth's surface is changing dramatically. Okay, ice, as you know, directly reflects back the sunlight. It's like a polished mirror. Okay, as ice is disappearing, the reflectivity is changing, and so more and more energy is being absorbed by the surface rather than getting reflected back. You see, reflection is a different thing than heating something and then re-emitting the radiation because reflection doesn't change the wavelength. Okay, if I shine something, it just goes back the same wavelength. So if, it, if CO2 was transparent coming in this way, it will also be transparent going out. But if you heat up something and then re-emit the radiation, the wavelength spectrum changes completely. And that's where you get the greenhouse effect. So it's not the same thing as reflection. All right? So those are the two reasons why we see more heating of the poles. Okay? So this is just a brief outline of why CO2 is important. H2O is not that critical. Now, of course, one thing about H2O you also have to understand is, yes, it may block radiation, but it is also blocking incoming radiation, not just outgoing radiation. So it, it affects or it alters things both ways. Okay? And that's why the, uh, the, um, the importance or, or the effect of H2O is somewhat more difficult to understand. So. Final question, how does the concentration of the gas come into play? Okay. So this is just a very broad overview of that. So the absorption coefficient we talked about is the mixture, the absorption coefficient of a mixture of gases at any wavelength is the summation over the absorption coefficients of the individual components of the gas times its mole fraction. Simple formula, right? And mole fraction, as you know, is related to concentration. So the higher the concentration, the higher the absorption coefficient will be. So if I take the atmosphere, I can take out the 78% nitrogen and 23% oxygen because the absorption coefficients of those two are almost close to zero. And I'm just left with CO2, H2O, methane, and so on. Okay, and I sum this up. So if CO2 increases significantly, it will affect the absorption coefficient. Okay. Here's some data. This is by the NOAA, again, I try to choose sources that are sort of official, okay? This is showing CO2 from 2011 to 2015, and as I said, for the very first time ever in the history of measured CO2, it crossed this 400 ppm barrier, okay? The dark, dark blue line is showing the um, moving average, and this is showing the actual data. Now, 
the fluctuations are due to season changes. As you know, the northern hemisphere has 68% land mass, and the southern hemisphere has only 32%. So bulk of the Earth's climate, vegetation-wise, is actually dictated by the northern hemisphere. So you see what's happening here is, look at this point here. This is pretty close to around May, June. So here is the start of 2013. Okay. This is around May, June. This is where your spring is in full gear, leaves are appearing on trees, and it's eating up all the CO2, CO2 plummets. By the time you get to October, November, okay, all the leaves are gone and the CO2 goes back up. So this is a cyclic procedure. All right? But clearly the mean is increasing slowly. So CO2 levels, the recorded history is that they were um, 250 ppm approximately for the past 10,000 years before World War II. Okay, and this is, a lot of this comes again from ice core data. Uh, many of you may know Professor Lonnie Thompson here uh, at OSU. He's been an outstanding leader in this field. Um, uh, Gore's movie, The Inconvenient Truth, actually used much of his data. Okay, uh, Al Gore's movie. Uh, so anyway, this is what people have found, and so therefore now that we've gone up to 400 ppm, that's a 37% increase. Okay. So therefore, what we're saying is, if I now look at my transmissivity formula, basically if I look at that, you know, this has increased by 37%. So now we are asking, okay, the transmissivity in 1930 of the atmospheric layer for outgoing radiation was something. Now it is something different because the CO2 concentration has increased. Okay, and then the question is, what is that ratio? Okay, how much more transmissive has it become? Okay, obviously that depends on what the starting value is. So here is a simple sort of table here, which is showing that, okay, if it was very small to begin with, this number, the optical thickness. Then this ratio is 96%, which means that it has only changed by 4%. But if this ratio was very large to begin with, okay, 10, then this is a significant change, okay, and it, it's very dangerous. So the question is, what is that approximate number, this optical thickness that we are talking about here? Okay, what is the real number? So I've just taken two references here. Uh, from two different journal papers. This one is actually a measured data by CLTN. Long time ago, 1968, appeared in Advances in Heat Transfer. So he actually measured it, and he couldn't go down below 555 Kelvin for measurement problems, uh, which says that the absorption coefficient is 38.7. And then there's a recent paper um, appeared in Journal of Quantitative Spectroscopy and Radiative Transfer. Uh, which estimates it to be about 26.3 at 300 Kelvin. So ballpark, you see those numbers are in the same ballpark. It's not like one is way off. Okay? So if I do a simple calculation and say, okay, mole fraction of CO2, 400 ppm, which is what we are at right now, okay? Uh, and we say, okay, op optical path, one kilometer. Now, of course, the atmosphere is 31 miles, but here I'm saying one kilometer. Why? Because we know CO2 is a heavy gas, most of it settles down close to the close to the ground, okay? And let's say, okay, the layer of CO2 is one, one kilometer, conservative. Okay? It's probably a lot more than that. <clears throat> so therefore, if I calculate my absorption coefficient, here is my number, 26.3. I've taken the smaller of the two values, okay? Again, to be conservative. Here's my concentration. Remember, it's kappa times mole fraction, okay? This is my mole fraction right there. 400 ppm, and then I've uh, multiplied it by the distance. Okay, so that gives me optical thickness of 10.5, right there. Okay, so if I plug it, look at that in my cable, I'm right here. In a very dangerous region, where tiny changes in CO2 concentration can cause huge changes in the transmissivity of the atmosphere. Okay, that's why scientists are so concerned, because they say we are in a very sensitive zone right here. Things are not changing linearly. This is obviously exponential change, and we're in a part of the curve where things are extremely sensitive. You have to be really, really careful. 
Um, now again, you know, if you discuss with people, then they will say, okay, you know, what's the big deal? It changes by 1%. 1% is a huge change because we are in that critical zone. Okay. So in summary, here are a few things I'd like to point out. Both CO2 and H2 are greenhouse gases. If sort of somebody, if somebody tells you that, just say yes, that's true. I'm not arguing against H2O being a greenhouse gas. However, its global warming threat is very small. I explained to you the greenhouse effect of what's happening with the different absorption bands. H2O really doesn't come into the picture. The other thing you also have to keep in mind is that we were concerned about poles. But in colder climates, the water vapor in the atmosphere is very, very low. Okay, Because everything just, you know, if you look at the psychrometric charts, the concentrations are much lower than the average in colder climates. Okay, Also, they have very rapid cycles. H2O concentrations can change by 100% within a matter of few hours. CO2 has a lifetime of close to 1,000 years. Okay. So it's very different from water vapor. 10.4 micron band of CO2 is primarily responsible for the greenhouse effect and radiation trapping. And I we discussed this at length, why that is the case. And the amount of solar radiation obviously it increases, uh, trapped by the atmosphere, increases exponentially with CO2 concentration because of this exponential beer lambert law. Okay, and this can easily lead to thermal runaway. So with that, I'll stop and take questions. Thank you.